All right, welcome everybody. Um, the topic today, this is actually, um, Scott at the very end of last session said I should talk about PACT sometime, um, PACT therapy. So that's what I'm gonna do today. Um, uh, those of, if, if there's any professionals out there or anyone who has read Stan's book or books, he has a lot of them, Stan Tatkin, um, you will notice that what I'm going to share today is not the full scope because um, in PACT therapy, um, we talk about the difference between the front end, which is what our clients interact with, and the back end, which is everything that us therapists need to know as theory. And one of the things I appreciate about PACT is um, there's not a huge emphasis on teaching your clients the theory. Um, it's more getting them to live it and experience it and start to know it from the bottom up in their bodies instead of, you know, lectures and you got to learn this vocabulary and there's a little bit of that. So I'm going to give you what the front end of PACT looks like and um, I'm going to talk about why I think it's helpful for couples in um, sex addiction or betrayal recovery because um, I actually think it's incredibly robust and it picks up some things that um some other models that I've been trained in. Um, I think PACT does a, a really good job at uh, helping couples in, in recovery in some really sticky points that I don't know that a lot of other models have great answers to. So um, I am training with the PACT Institute. I've done level one and two, and then there's a level three, and then there's a certification process. So I feel like after getting my CSAT, this is like my third master's degree that I'll be working on, even though it's not really a degree, but it's a lot of work and there's a lot of uh, things to learn, a lot of training. Um, I just about all of the relationship principles I talk about in my Seeking Integrity uh, videos here, they're all PACT principles. Um, and PACT, Stan, Stan Tatkin will note that um, PACT is an eclectic model, meaning it draws from a lot of places. So as PACT therapists, we believe that we stand on the shoulders of giants. So in talking about this, I'm not saying this is original to PACT. I'm saying PACT packages these ideas that, of course, many of them were, were pioneered and thought out and used before PACT ever came along. Um, so um, PACT uh, stands for the Psychobiological Approach to Couples Therapy. And I think that's more of a name for the therapist than it is for the clients. So what it means for you as the client is we are going to look at every way you and your partner interact and communicate. And we're going to help you find ways where the presentation does not match the message or help you to figure out what to do when the message doesn't match the presentation. Um, so we're concerned with getting to truth and reality and um, again, largely working with couples, not from the left brain space, but from the embodiment space. What are you feeling and what are you experiencing together now? And I hope it becomes clear why that's a good idea as I explain a few more of the principles. So PACT is really good at helping couples helping on a uh, focus on a few uh, really critical things to a relationship, especially in the beginning phases of PACT. It's less about working through your issues and more about getting set up to be able to work through your issues. Um, because 100% of the couples who come in my door, um, even the ones who think that they're really motivated and really ready to work on issues are not. And they do these things that they don't even realize get in the way of them being able to work effectively. So the beginning phases of PACT are about um, learning a discipline, um, learning what works and what doesn't, uh, getting the setup right so that you're not um, getting in your own way or you and your partner getting in each other's ways of, of working effectively collaboratively. So PACT helps you learn and understand what is going on between the two of us. That's the psychobiological side. So we've heard a ton of what each other are saying um, sometimes. Uh, a lot of couples think they've heard each other and they really haven't. Um, they may assume that because I heard you, that's all I need to know. And it's usually not. So um, when you work with a packed therapist and they help draw your attention to your partner's face, um, help you interpret how your partner is breathing, help you connect where I've seen this before, not just in my partner, but maybe in my family of origin and help you understand how that kicks off things inside of you. 
So PACT helps you get a, a really comprehensive look at what's going on between the two of us and how can we use that information um, to further our relationship goals together. Um, second, it helps you uh, to answer the question, who are you? You as the individual and your partner. To me, this is uh, learning about attachment styles and how our attachment history impacts how we show up now. Um, attachment is generally something that does not change, um, at least in adulthood. It's, I think, malleable in childhood. So PACT is not looking at uh, weeding out um, pathological attachment styles and correcting those. It's interested in you two learning about, um, or if you're in a polyamorous relationship, which PACT deals with all the time, um, helping the members of the coupleship um, learn about each other and know what makes one another tick and where that comes from. And instead of trying to eradicate problematic things, finally building room for it. So I think about this in, in the problem that we used to have in our living room. Our dogs um, feel like they own the couch, which I understand is a really like normal dog thing. And both they and us would get annoyed all the time that we'd have to be asking them to move. And sometimes we'd get a really belligerent 50 pound golden doodle looking at me like, no way am I moving. Um, what we discovered is when we didn't offer them any alternatives for their space, um, we had conflict. So we simply moved the dog beds into the living room, which may be an eyesore, but um, by and large, uh, there's times our dogs want to be on the couch, but a lot of the time they want to be on their beds because none of us want to be on the beds. They never have to fight a human for a position on the dog bed. Um, it's those kind of structural changes that once you understand your partner's attachment style and they understand yours, you can start looking at, have we constructed a relationship that actually fits both of us? And um, we can change that, not each other. It also helps you understand personality. Um, we say in PACT, your job is to have the owner's manual on your partner and you have to write it. They didn't come with one and um, often their perception of who they are and how they work is not complete. So you really have to work collaboratively to figure out who we each are and what that means for how we work. And then the third thing is what do we want? So it helps to clarify shared vision and purpose. Um, Harari, who wrote the book Sapiens, which is a really fascinating read, um, he talks about how to get groups of people to cooperate together, they have to have a shared idea. He calls it a shared mythology because it's actually made up by the members of the group. Um, it's not like we go on this quest and we find the higher purpose of our relationship. We make it up. Um, so the shared vision is the idea that the two of you make together. This is what our relationship is about. This is what it must do. And um, these are the things that we need to stick to or avoid in order to make sure our vision happens, um, that this relationship stays formed in our own images, not based on our past, our fears, or somebody else's idea for us. So um, all of this is accomplished against the backdrop of secure functioning. So big reveal, do your own drum roll if you would like. These are the principles, and it says it's still loading, here we go. These are the principles of secure functioning. So um, what couples have to do is take these ideas and turn them into we always statements. And these wouldn't be statements about the past. These would be statements about in the future, we must always. So relationships that are not built on fairness, justice, sensitivity, cooperation. I have cooperation in there twice. I just realized because I don't proofread my stuff. Um, shared power and authority, absolute mutual protection, respect for respect and protection of primacy, collaboration and effective regulation of stress and distress. Relationships that aren't built on that are just too unfair too much of the time. They don't work for both parties. Um, now, if you look at what principles are and how they work, principles are not rules. Principles are big ideas. And actually, in order to live by a principle, there are a lot of different ways you can get there. It all depends on where you're starting from. And when we align to this principle, we end up with fairness. But that may look really different from, you know, the fairness we think of when we're a kid is evenness, equal equality. 
um, if you've ever tried in your primary relationship or your family relationship to get equality, um, you've probably driven yourself crazy. Fairness may be more about neither of us feeling misused, what our relationship needs to provide and, and you know the, the stuff we need to get done actually happens and we work together in a way on that. Um, fairness is accomplished by a lot of different means. Justice is um, what we engage in when the principles of secure functioning are not upheld. In other words, when a wrong is committed, justice is our plan for how we get back into all of these different things. So justice can be as simple as I tell you how I feel and there's an apology. Or it could range, like when we talk about betrayal trauma, into a whole life and relationship rehab. In order to get justice here, we need to stop behavior that betrays and is not two-person oriented or doesn't think about the safety and well-being of two people. Um, we need to get to the bottom of, of how and why secrets are kept and stop that. Um, but in the end, that's to serve justice uh, and, and not in a punitive way, but restoring that which was taken is what justice is. Sensitivity, um, that relates to, it's not just, you know, we tiptoe around each other. In fact, I've noticed as my spouse and I have worked more on secure functioning, we are less tiptoey around each other. We're more direct because we actually indexed further on the side of avoidance um, than on engagement. So sensitivity um, is about understanding how one another function and how I function and doing what's best for both parties. Um, cooperation is working together. Um, a lot of couples have what I would call pseudo cooperation, which is they work in parallel. Cooperation is actually making ourselves intersect and even having some conflict and some struggle and figuring out what's best for the two of us. <clears throat> Shared power and authority is just like it says, power and authority is shared in the coupleship in a way that is understood by both, agreed upon by both, and both can state why our arrangement of power and authority is a good idea for both of us. So in other words, when it comes to power and authority, we know what we're doing. Um, nobody's blindfolded or you know working in the dark here. Absolute mutual protection in public and in private means that we put our, the safety of our partner and our relationship first. So we don't, generally, we don't talk bad behind each other's backs. We don't um, embarrass one another. We don't um, put each other in situations that are painful or humiliating or otherwise degrading. And if we do, we correct it immediately. I'm so sorry. I should, like, I, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was I was at one of my favorite cross-country skiing venues, mountain biking, and um, I was telling, uh, it was, this is one of the first times I'd been up there mountain biking, and the, the friend that I was with was showing me trails that he liked, and I was showing him on the map the cross-country skiing trails that we like, and I was telling him about an experience just this last winter. One of my favorite cross-country skiing trails has a really steep climb in kind of this remote back road. And then you get this really nice gradual downhill with some nice like sweeping turns. And I think it's really fun. Um, but I, I tend to have this blind spot. I tend to overlook risk and fear. And I think about what it's gonna be like on the other side. So I'm thinking about the downhill while I'm trudging up this hill and my, my spouse is behind me literally cursing me out. And she says, this is too dangerous for me. I don't feel safe. Like, why do you take me on stuff like this? And the correct answer, which I think I did a decent job at after I was laughing because I'm insensitive, um, I said, what would you like to do? Would it be best if we turned around and we could do something easier? Would you like me to carry your skis up and you can walk up? Do you want me to be behind you? And we actually, we, we negotiated a resolution um, to where we could get through the part that made her scared. Um, we could get through that part and get to the fun part. And in the end, I said, do you see what I mean by like, it's fun to be in situations where your life is at risk because later you can look back and say, I can't believe we got through that. And like the survival story is part of the fun. And she said, no, it's still too close to that. I should check again with her because I bet my theory is correct that she'll look back and say that was okay. 
but probably not because I have a blind spot there. And then um, collaboration is just like in, in my story there. We work together to come up with solutions. Um, one of my favorite couples to ask, what, or one of my favorite questions to ask couples is who's in charge here? Um, because in the beginning, before they really get secure functioning, um, they panic and point fingers at each other, or you see their helplessness come out. So collaboration is that idea that we're both bosses and we have to act that way all the time. There is not a problem in the world that doesn't require the brain power and effort of both of us to solve. Um, and we make sure that any decision that we make or any road that we go down as a couple, we are fully in agreement before we head down that road. And then um, cooperation is so important, I put in there twice. And then effective regulation of stress and distress. Again, I think that's actually the baseline of safety is we watch each other closely enough so that when, when I can see that what I'm saying puts you into pain, it doesn't necessarily mean that I stop what I'm saying or you know back off. It means that I help you with your pain. I was working with a couple just barely where they had to start using the phrase, I promise I'm not trying to dig. Um, I promise I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Um, that was that for, for them in that moment, that was effective uh, regulation of stress and distress because they could both stay calmer. Um, that whole like nothing up my sleeve um, was really effective at them being able to stay within their window of tolerance and not go to war with each other. So um, this is the backdrop of PACT. Um, so initially, when you start working with a PACT therapist, um, for the couples that I have worked with uh, where there's been betrayal trauma, this part can be a little disorienting and even painful. And I've had partners tell me, um, this is bull crap. I don't want you to focus on this because I'm mad. And I get that. Um, but here's why this backdrop is really important because part of healing betrayal is saying from today forward, we will inflict no more pain on one another that does not get addressed with sensitivity and all of the things here. So in my estimation, um, both members of a coupleship, no matter what has happened, are responsible to maintain secure functioning. Because if we don't have that, what you have is a relationship that is built on, we do what we feel like when we feel like it. So if I don't, if I'm mad at you and I don't feel like you deserve fairness, what I'm showing you is that I will only do what I feel, not what is right. And one of the biggest sources of trust rebuilding, and it's my assertion that in betrayal, trust is destroyed on both sides for different reasons, but trust is destroyed on both sides. Um, it doesn't help trust to show each other, I will only do what I feel. It actually helps trust a lot when we can show each other, I will do the right thing even when the right thing is the hardest thing. Because what that says is I'm interested in my frontal lobe being part of this relationship. I'm interested in that part of my brain that looks to um, maximize reward for the long-term and minimize problems and, and punishment. It's that whole thing that makes us humans is the ability to think ahead and to make choices that might forego pleasure now in, in the service of something better later. So um, secure functioning is always both parties' responsibility. Um, secure functioning does not mean commitment. Secure functioning doesn't mean I wanna be with you forever and I can trust you. Notice how trust isn't part of secure functioning. I think trust is an outgrowth of secure functioning. If these things, can you imagine any relationship you're a part of that does all of these things and you don't trust them, at least to some degree? Um, so um, secure functioning is also, uh, like it doesn't work to say to each other, um, I'll do it if you do it. Because again, that shows we're only interested in doing what we feel. I'm only here um, to get what I want versus to do the right thing by you, even if it's the hardest thing. So I do think relationships break down when both parties can't come to secure functioning at the same time often enough. So I think it's totally fair to say, you know, we only turn it on when we feel like the other one's invested. What does that mean for us? Maybe it means that our thought about how invested we are, we actually have to question that because it may not be true. 
or our desire to um, hold up the potentiality of our relationship, uh, even when we're in the face of huge struggle, um, our desire may be actually lower than we thought it was. And I'm not saying that that's a bad place to come from. We have to get to truth for a relationship to be able to um, be what it can be. So if you would like to learn more about PACT, I put the website here, the, thepactinstitute.com. Um, Stan has some really good videos on there. There's some really good explainers and there's a directory for PACT therapists around the world. Um, so just a, just a little bit more um, about the front end of PACT, what you would experience as a client. So in the beginning, especially PACT is a discipline. Your therapist will hold you um, to the line of secure functioning um, so that you two can have an environment that's safe enough to work through your problems. That's one thing that I see for couples in addiction recovery is so, so important. And I love the way that PACT gets to it. Um, there is not a request in the world, say for example, from a betrayed partner, there's not a request in the world from a betrayed partner that a, an addicted or a betraying partner could not wrap their mind around, why is my partner asking for this? And even get on board with, oh, here's why I think this is a good idea. You know, I always use the example with, with the betrayed partners I work with. You could ask your partner for the moon if that's what you thought would make yourself safe. Maybe your partner does the homework and says, oh, you know, she really thinks that being queen of the moon would make her invincible. <laughs> Maybe it would. You know, we haven't seen a queen of the moon before. Um, but the point is, if you really collaborate and cooperate, you can get into and you can understand where your partner is coming from and something that initially you say, there's no way in hell I want to do that or can do that. You may actually find yourself motivated saying, I actually think that's a really good idea. And while I can't produce it now, I'll figure out a way to do it because I think that would be fantastic. I essentially, it's not like I believe you. It's I get what you're saying. I see the vision. Um, so um, working these principles as a discipline, like I said earlier, it's often I, I do these even if I don't feel like it, um, because there's a ton that we have to do to make relationships work that we don't necessarily feel like. I think I've said it here before. Um, it's a cruel, cruel part of how humans are put together. We need connection, but we have like no instinct for long term connection. If you follow your instincts, just your instincts in a relationship, um, you end up doing what's best for you and nobody else. So we also have to use that frontal lobe planning part of our brain that helps us override our initial impulses for selfishness or self-centeredness or harm to others at, at the, you know, pursuing our own uh, safety, which is all really normal human in, inbound stuff. Um, but we, we have to be able to rise above that. And we also have, we have the hardware to do it. We're just not biologically primed to think that way. We have to learn it, it's a discipline. Um, and like I said before, secure functioning is not the same as commitment. So saying we will function securely and, and in, in essence, treat each other decently through this is not the same as saying all is forgiven and I want to be with you and don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's not the same at all. It's saying we have to have a foundation in place where we don't continue to injure and cause chaos for each other so we can think clearly and so we can really problem solve together and I count it as a success with my couples if they come to the, the conclusion that they need a divorce or they can't continue on together. If they come to that conclusion from this, this place of secure functioning, it actually feels like a really helpful, if, if not sad decision. Oh, I'm sad we're here, but you know what? We can both see this is what's best for us. And then when they're unwinding the relationship, they don't make it hell for each other. And they, they actually help each other um, get free and get to a place where they can pursue what they should have, which is love and security and all of that. So um, here's how I think PACT can help couples in recovery. Um, it puts the focus um, and you get help on getting to collaboration. Now, um, what I hear from a lot of couples when I bring this up in their early recovery, they'll say, well, his or her whole addiction has all been all about. They don't collaborate. Like, shouldn't they get to a place where they can do that before we do couples therapy? And I can see the reasoning behind that. And my question back is, how does someone get to that place if they're not challenged to do it? 
That's how we grow with everything. I realize the bar is here. And if I want to do this, I'm going to have to work at it. My oldest um, in kindergarten, he thought reading was the worst. Um, it didn't come easily to him. And so he kind of took the attitude of like, I don't want to do this. So I'm not going to do this. So he left kindergarten as not a real strong reader. Well, his first day in first grade, he came back and said, oh, how was it? And he said, oh, it was good. I like my class. And he said, but he said everybody in my class is a really good reader and I'm not. And um, he buckled down and he read every night and he read out loud and he caught up and he even got above grade level by the end of the year. So when people are challenged, they have a choice. When you don't challenge them, there is no choice. And like I've said before, sobriety does not equal relationship skills. The, the difficulties in the relationship are certainly not helped by secrecy and betrayal, but it's not like there's this inborn relationship genius underneath an addiction. No, it has to be learned. So I think PACT can be really helpful for couples, even in early recovery, because it puts the bar on effective collaboration. And if you have a good therapist, they will help you to be able to do that and understand what that feels like and um, what it is and what it isn't. Also in PACT, we don't accept, I don't know how. Stan, Stan will always say, I don't know how means I don't think I should have to, or I don't want to. So again, the bar is already set on you two need to be interested in secure functioning and it needs to start happening. Um, so it also puts the focus on effective management of stress and distress. We talk a lot about in early recovery, how the partner needs empathy and the addict struggles with that. I like the packaging of managing stress and distress because it's something that for an addicted person, they can see the effects of immediately. If what I'm doing is relieving my partner, if what I'm doing is helping my partner, if what I'm doing is alleviating tension, I'm on the right road, largely. Um, so that focus, again, for the addicted person, it puts the bar high for empathy. It's really hard to uh, manage uh, stress and distress accurately if you don't understand it. So if there's deficits in that, Packed therapy exposes that. And instead of giving the addicted person this general theory of empathy, they're learning on the person who it matters for the most. So you're learning the kind of empathy your partner needs, not empathy in general. Because I can't count how many times I've heard from my addicted clients. Well, I read this book on empathy and I, you know, I did the whole reflective listening with my partner and it just made a matter. Oh, because maybe your partner has learned that people's words are often full of lies. And so it may not be the words that are the way to show empathy to your partner. It might be the soft, safe, gentle touch. It might be the maintenance of eye contact. It might be the tell me more. So you get real-time training with the person who you need to learn how to be most empathetic with. And then, you know, in, in line with what my philosophy on this, this, uh, webinar has been from the very beginning, it gives you things that both of you can do from day one. There are no minimum requirements. Um, a relationship can be improved by anybody from any place that they're at. So it gives you really simple, concrete things to focus on that will um, make the environment of your relationship better. So I love PACT for couples who are new to recovery because the first job of PACT is not can we get to a place where we can work through issues um, or can we work through issues? It's, do you even understand what the place is you need to be in to work through issues? And it teaches it really, really well. So um, here's how betrayal figures in. Um, many people will look at the PACT model and say, yes, but what if there's betrayal? None of this counts. And you're not wrong. So in the beginning, um, when there's betrayal, the betrayed spouse sets the terms for continuance in the relationship. So in the beginning, it's the betrayed spouse who, who defines this is what would be fair. Because as the spouse who's done the betraying, you took that into your own hands and you didn't consider your partner. So there needs to be a balancing the scale. There needs to be a clear representation of the interest of the partner who's been betrayed. The betrayed partner sets the terms for justice. What I need from you is. Um, the betraying spouse may have to work at discovering why a particular request is a good idea. Do that homework. That's not a problem in PACT if your partner says, I need you to attend meetings. And your initial response is, no way in hell, I don't want to do that. 
that initial response is fine, but you are also tasked with, you need to investigate and understand not just why your partner's asking you for it, but can you come up with any reasons why that might be a good idea for you to do? So instead of what I think a lot of couples get from, from a lot of betrayal trauma models that are out there is if my partner asks for it, I'm just supposed to do it. I think in the long run, yeah, it should look that way, but there also needs to be this like middle step of, I need to figure out how to buy in to what my partner is asking. Because honestly, once I'm bought in, once it makes sense to me, um, I can stop debating, I can stop dragging my feet and I can get right to work and I can do really effective things because I understand why this would be a good idea for my partner. And then um, this idea of shared power, it can really only be achieved in a relationship where there is mutual protection. So this is where sobriety figures in. This is where emotional safety figures in. Um, I, I believe all secured uh, functioning relationships need shared power and authority that's understood by both. Um, but understanding that that can't be achieved while there's not mutual protection. Um, I've seen it help couples focus on um, kind of the steps. Here's the step we're on. Here's what we're working on and understanding that there are a lot of aspects of a secure functioning or, or a relationship that feels good that are just not accessible without some bedrock baseline things in place. So there's a quick and dirty pact. I know that's like 30 minutes. I could talk a lot more about this, but I'll stop there so we can ask, answer questions. Um, thank you so much, John. And by the way, there's questions in the Q&A. Type them in there. Whatever we don't get to today, we'll save for our next session and we'll just kind of pick up with them. Um, this is not about like resolving a specific concept. This is the framework within, we really, that was worded badly, but the framework that we need if we're going to effectively resolve. Concept. Yeah, it's, it's learning, it's learning a process, not an outcome. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I constantly hear myself saying, fight the problem, not each other. Um, this is the framework that we need if we're going to fight the problem. There's another yeah. step. It's yeah. like, okay, how do we do it effectively yeah. while, you know, staying in our window of tolerance? Um, you know, I mean, most of the big fights happen because somebody gets dragged out of their window of tolerance, you know, and, um, you know, you mentioned like the owner's manual. I need to have my partner's owner's manual. Um, and it's up to me to write it because they're not going to hand it to me. Um, what is the process of me? I mean, what do I need to look for as I write my partner's owner's manual? Do I ask questions? Do I talk to it? I mean, how do I go about that? Yeah, well, I mean, asking questions can be good and there's really good data that comes out. Um, oh, sorry. Reading about attachment, understanding attachment general, that's part of where it comes from. The very best material for the owner's manual and your partner is to watch their face and how they respond to things. And certainly how they respond to you, but all sorts of things like watch your partner when you're in a crowded place, what happens to them? I know if my partner watches me, she would see me scanning all the time because I'm probably a little hypervigilant. Um, if we're in a crowded place for too long, she would probably see me withdrawing a little bit more, maybe pulling out my phone a little bit more, going off by myself. Um, watch your partner in a lot of different situations, and especially as you talk to them, um, look at what they respond to. So for, for example, um, I work with a lot of couples where there's a mismatch. Um, one partner thinks that talking things through is just the best. And another partner hates it and thinks that like low demand time is, is the best. So when you're talking to your partner, watch, where do I start to lose my audience? What do they get confused about? Because they'll show you on their face, but most couples I work with don't look at each other. So that's a really good way to start writing that owner's manual is pay attention to each other. Um, this is fascinating. Um, <laughs> we, may, we may continue packed discussions later. Um, but let's get into the, the Q&A, and I promise everybody, get all your questions in, and we'll pick them up in two weeks, whatever we don't get to today, I promise. Um, okay. Uh, um, I don't know what recovery should look like when the betraying partner is not a sex addict. Uh, we did full disclosure and polygraph with the therapist about six months ago, 
And I learned he's had over 35 emotional affairs, but nothing sexual in any way, not even porn or strip clubs. I also learned he had affairs in previous relationships, but all screening for sex addiction mentions actual sex. Uh, he gaslights, blame shifts, lives an entire double life, so my betrayal trauma feels the same. I just don't know where to go for help. This is an interesting question, and I am very curious to hear your answer, John. Well, so here's here's how it hits me. Um, sex addiction used to be the umbrella term for like porn addiction, love addiction, relationship addiction. Um, we're learning more that there's actually some like distinct differences. So I, I've seen, and I know Dr. Rob has talked about this. If I put my porn addicted guys in a sex addiction group, they don't relate. And it's not that they're vastly different. It's just, there's some nuances how the story goes together. So I, I'm just going to go with my gut here. 35 emotional affairs and affairs in previous relationships, even if nothing sexual is happening, there might be a love or relationship addiction going on. And guess what? Most addicts protect the supply by gaslighting and blame shifting and living a double life. So the focus may not be sex. And that may be, that's something that I've seen a lot of addicts use to minimize. Well, I'm not out screwing people. Um, true, you're not. But like, if, if we replace uh, sex with relationship or sex with love, oh, all of a sudden this, this whole like seeking and secretive behavior, it starts to make sense. So that might be helpful is to um, take the focus off of sex addiction or look at it the old way. This is an umbrella term. What kind of sex addiction do we have? This sounds like a lot more love and relationship than it does sex. That's what I would say to that. Yeah, I'm. Uh, that's what I was thinking too. I mean, Love addicts, uh, you know, sex addicts get high, literally a, neuro, a neurochemical high from the fantasy of sex, the pursuit of sex. Um, they get a much bigger high from that than they get from the actual sex, um, which is interesting neurochemically. Love addicts get a similar high, but they get it from what we call limerence, which is meeting somebody new. Oh, they're perfect. You know, everything that's going to be annoying in a couple of months is like perfect now you know, like the gum popping or the weird laugh or whatever. Uh, it's like a Seinfeld episode, you know, or something. That's, that's like every Seinfeld episode. <laughs> yes. What, what stupid thing is weird with this person so I can't be with them? Yes, yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, but it, for the first month or so, or six months or three months or whatever, it's great. And I can get high from this fantasy of being with this other person. Um, and I and I literally get high and I use it the same for the same reasons that an alcoholic drinks or a sex addict looks at porn or which is to escape stress and anxiety and things like that. It's it's an escape from the real world. Um, love addiction is a real thing. Um, the treatment process is pretty much parallel to the way we treat sex addicts, but again usually a different 12-step program because you want to identify with people with them. John, you want to jump in, jump in, go ahead. I'm just going to say, I, I was in a, I was in a, watching a presentation by my colleague, Ken Adams, about the adult children of sex addicts. And his whole point, he, he started saying this room full of professionals, everybody drop your favorite model. Because we're not talking about that yet. It's so important to get the, the narrative right first. And once you have the narrative right, then you can use your favorite model. And I think it's I think it's the same with the spectrum of sex, love, porn, addiction. Is you really have to get the narrative to begin with right, or the model doesn't it doesn't resonate. And I'm I'm amazed to see what happens with my love addicted clients when we transfer away from a sex addiction narrative into a love addiction narrative. All of a sudden, they're like, oh. Oh yeah, well that makes. Oh, here's why I need meetings, and here's yeah. why I need to stay away from this. But the narrative really does matter. Yeah, yeah, and and but as far as where to go for help, um, I, it's the same CSAT. They're trained. A good CSAT will recognize the difference between love addiction and sex addiction and porn addiction, okay. and frame the narrative properly. Um, the work that gets done is pretty much the same <laughs> as we barrel forward, but. The framework is different and, and the therapist does need to understand, I mean, uh, 
I don't, I don't know if your husband's been screened for sex addiction, but yeah, it's not going to show up per, t- per se because it's the wrong screen. Yeah. Um, so, but the same CSAT therapists are, it's the umbrella training. And, and I, I would think that's the best place to go on any thoughts or. Yeah. And, and I would say some CSATs do better with detecting the love addiction and the nuance piece yeah. than others. I mean, the, the initial tr- uh, screening that a lot of CSATs use is called the SAST. And then there's a larger one called the SDI, which is a clinical instrument and it includes yeah. the SAST, but the SDI does a really good job of telling us what kind is this. So yeah. even if there's low sexual activity, it will pick up relationship, fantasy, yeah. love, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, thank you. And yeah, I mean, talk to the therapist before you go or in your first session, you know, screen them. <laughs> like, do you understand love addiction? Because that's what we're dealing with here. Um, okay, I love my husband so much, even though he cheated on me. And sometimes when I'm sitting next to him and feeling my heart feel full of love for him, just the way it has for 30 years, I get overcome with feelings of self-hate, like I'm betraying myself by loving him. Is this normal? Um, how do I begin to get past this? Mm. You know, I think all the time, the kind of love that parents have for their children and the kind of love that romantic partners can have for each other, like there's not a stark dividing line. So that idea of I love you, even if you've done horrible things, I don't think is, a, is how a crazy person approaches a, 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 a romantic relationship. So first of all, that idea that, you know, something's wrong with me if I feel that way, you can, you can just throw that out. Nothing's wrong with you um, that you feel that way. The, the idea that am I betraying myself I wouldn't say by loving him, I would say by continuing this relationship as it is, that's fertile ground to look at. Um, That could actually be helpful because if the answer is yes, there's options. The only, the only answer isn't leave. The answer could be, let's talk through, you know, and I think about practice principles. One one of the most common topics I get or overriding principles I see in self-betrayal is I'm not concerned with fairness for myself. I can look all day long at what would make you feel better, but I don't speak up for myself. So maybe structurally, that would be something that could change in the relationship so that it works better for you. But I I would start with that question, how do I begin to get past this? Please, please, please don't beat yourself up for loving somebody. We love people for all sorts of reasons and love is not logical. That's why we say it's this great power because it really is. Um, it's also not sufficient to create a relationship that works for both of you. So love is not all there is. It's a really wonderful, not even just starting point. Um, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen couples that I've worked with who have decided to divorce and still deeply love each other. And they even show each other a lot of love in that divorce process. And that's okay. It's there's there's nothing wrong with loving someone that hurts you, but can our relationship be functional? I think is separate from love. It helps, but it's not sufficient by itself. Yeah, and um, I, I popped um, there's a great book for betrayed partners called The Betrayal Bind by Michelle Mays. Um, it it deals with this question among other things. I think it's the best betrayed partners book out there by far not being a betrayed partner. So take that for what it's worth, but I think it's excellent. Um, And Michelle talks about what she calls relationship ambivalence, which is exactly what you just described. I love him, but man, I want to kick him hard sometimes. And then I feel weird because I'm staying with this person who hurt me. And, you know, she addresses that really well. And, and you know, and, and I like that she makes it clear, you are not alone. Um, lots of betrayed partners have these feelings. I mostly talk to addicts and, you know, I'll tell them, you know, one minute your betrayed partner is going to love you and the next minute she's going to want you like a thousand miles away is too close. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that because she's on an emotional roller coaster. Um, and the guys, the, the, the addicts I work with, they're on an emotional roller coaster too. And unfortunately the roller, co- it's two different roller coasters. Um, but, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's fairly normal for betrayed partners to want to beat themselves up for still loving a cheater. Um, and that doesn't mean this relationship can't survive. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you for staying. Uh, it just means that the two of you have a lot of work to do, both individually and together. It's possible to maintain functional boundaries and even boundaries that hurt in some ways and still really love a person. In fact, I think functional boundaries are an expression of love. Um, so yeah, you, you might you might start by seeing if you can separate those feelings from what you need for a relationship to be safe because they're often independent. I, I can't fully explain all the reasons why I love the people that I love. And a lot of times it doesn't make sense and that's okay because love is not a logic thing. Um, okay, let's try and get to one more today and then everything else we will keep. And I promise in two weeks, I will have the list and we will bring up all the questions we didn't get to. Um, I'm the I am the partner of a recovering porn and fantasy addict who also struggles with sex positivity, low self-worth, and in my opinion, a feeling of being fundamentally broken and flawed. Uh, in one of your previous webinars, you spoke of both partners needing to come to the table with the belief that they're not that they're not bad rather than trying to resolve that in the relationship as you stated there's nothing fundamentally wrong with me that was my work no relationship could give it to me no matter how willing they were we've had four painful years of cohabitation and i'm wondering if a period of connected separation um, i.e living separately remaining committed to working on ourselves and our relationship so a therapeutic separation might help um, any thoughts there um, on that? Yeah. So there's a lot in that question. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of things that a therapeutic separation can accomplish. One is differentiation. And so differentiation is another, it's a principle that fits really well with PACT. So in order to have a relationship and relationships are built on negotiation, you have to have different wants and needs and and, you know, desires and all of that. Sometimes it's hard to hear your own wants and needs and desires when somebody else is close by. There can be all sorts of reasons for that. Um, maybe you've always uh, been timid and struggled to uh, voice your feelings. Maybe you grew up in a home where it was dangerous to voice your feelings and it was better to just, um, you know, try to take care of another person and not rock the boat. Um, one one of the things in this situation that that you know you of course explore this with a therapist please I'm not your therapist um so explore this with with someone who who knows you better but one of the things that I could see a therapeutic separation possibly helping with in this situation is some healthy differentiation and I like the I like what you said about a period of connected separation so this isn't turning our shoulder on each other this is saying. I'm having a hard time feeling and and understanding myself to the point where all of my like negative self-image tendencies and my shame keeps flooding in here because I don't know who I am separate from this. Um, I don't know who I am when I hear what you're saying, which again, it's a really common problem that people have. So um, some connected separation would be we are focusing on living some separate lives and getting reconnected with ourselves and telling each other what's coming up for us in that. Let me tell you what I'm discovering. Let me tell you the experiences I'm having. Here's the feelings that I'm having. Um, that, that can be really helpful. In general, when we look at therapeutic separation, the first criteria I look at is, are these two people having a hard time staying out of each other's feelings? And I don't mean like dispassionately disconnected. I mean, like when one person is feeling something is that an automatic trigger for the other person to go to the same place or uh, an oppositional place? In other words, do we have the capacity to maintain our own emotional experience and sense of self? And um, when that's hard to come by, I think therapeutic separations can be good medicine for that, but they do need to be planned and structured. And you know, um, most of the clients that I've worked with on that, uh, the, the general feedback I get is, man, we had to think about this to an annoying degree because it's not, it's not like a take two and call me in the morning thing. Like it's surgery and um, it really needs to be done carefully and with purpose and that um, both parties are aware of what we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to get there. Um, 
Thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time for today. Um, I copied all the questions we didn't get to. I'm going to save them for next time around. And I just want to throw out to John, uh, you, met, you said you could talk a lot more about PACT. I personally would love to hear you talk more about PACT uh, in an upcoming session, whether it's okay. next time around or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can I can definitely do that, and I'll 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 put in just a quick plug here. Um, so I do packed intensives for couples; they're they're personalized. So, um, packed is also a really good therapy. Uh, it's a good model for intensive therapy. So, you can get a lot out of you know a week's worth of work. Um, so, if you're interested, uh, feel free to find my my website whitepinerecovery.com. And you can message me through there and um, we can talk about getting together for some packed work. And somebody just typed in, where can I find a recording of this webinar? I will get it posted on our YouTube channel, which is Seeking Integrity um, today. Um, and you can also find it on the previous webinars uh, page on our, on our Sex and Relationship Healing website. Um, and I'll try and get it up this afternoon. So. Um, John, thank you so much. Everybody, whitepinerecovery.com is John's website. It has all kinds of great info and also links to uh, his mother and mesh men work groups and the PAC work groups, which I didn't know you had. So I'm glad you brought that up. So um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for great questions. And um, we'll see you in uh, a couple of weeks. Yeah, thanks.